My name is Sebastian and in this video I'm gonna give you a tour of my doc files that you can find on GitHub because I was asked this a few times so let's go over them and I can explain why I have certain configurations and also well what they're good for. So basically this is what you can get on GitHub here and I have the configuration here which is pretty much what I have on my system. I do have a little bit more which is just private things and you know customer related stuff that I'm not able to share but basically all of the the important functionality is there so let's go over it one by one shall we so the first file that you can see is a dot aliases which is um, just well a convention I like to use which is connected to the Z shell um, integration here so actually um, in order to show you this I'm gonna start with the Z shell RC and the aliases which here is just my uh, Z shell with a bunch of stuff that I have uh, just for the cursor uh, to to look correctly. So basically I use all my Z shell as you can see here with a certain theme that I'm used to with certain plugins that give me the auto completion. I have the all my Z shell integration here. Then certain colors that I like to set up. So that's pretty much that. Uh, some of it I just am used to them. Some of it is because I like uh, to have my Vim set up here for example. Um, you see the cursor changes whether I'm in insert mode, uh, mode or not and I want my shell to be the same. So basically once you have this or that it just shows you uh, in this way and that's how I, how I got here. Um, all right, then that's uh, pretty much it. I think that's uh, that's that auto load and uh, yeah, key ch uh, keychain. I mean, sh nothing too specific here. Um, the rest is uh, actually in the oh my Z shell uh, file, which we're gonna go in a second. Aliases are a super cool thing for your command line. So if you're not using aliases, then you definitely uh, should uh, check them out. I got a bunch of videos on this topic uh, in the past, so this is really important and cool if you want to be more effective on a command line. Basically, what do I have? A lot of lot of them. So as you can see, I do have different behaviors of my aliases. I also shared some content uh, about that in the past. So for example, there are certain aliases that just expand. If I say I want to have a Maven a build or, you know, Docker or Kubernetes, get services, something like this, I like to type my aliases and then see what I actually get with space. So they expand. There are some aliases, however, that should not expand. So for example, if I say uh, something like ls, then I don't want to see the whole output here or this particular tree for which is ignored that should just be shown as such. So uh, for that, I wrote a function that is also included, which you can see in my dot files later for like um, uh, i, like incognito or something like that uh, alias. Actually, don't remember why I called it i, but yeah, uh, another function. Here, just uh, basic Unix behavior, you know, some Unix stuff uh, that I just use all the time. Um, some desktop be um, uh, related things. These are executables that I created uh, myself. So them you can actually also find um, on, well, not all of them, curl is just curl, uh, but uh, the ones I use here, uh, you can find in the dot files as well on the bin, which we'll see in a second. Uh, this is the network, yeah, because I'm one of these crazy people who <laughs> use all their system related stuff on the command line. So I actually control my, my network and I'm going to search for, you know, Wi-Fi and everything on the command line because that's what I'm just used to on Linux. But whatever, uh, some aliases help you there. Um, this is from the time when I used to travel a lot. I actually had to set my time zone so often uh, because, you know, switching time zones so many times that I actually have a, an alias for a shortcut to change the time zone on my computer. It's just faster. Um, now some other related stuff. I have a lot of things for Maven. I use it all the time. So just, you know, find all of these uh, things, the combinations of goals here that you, um, you know, execute all the time, even something like skip test, because, you know, if you need it sometimes and you type this otherwise often, it makes sense to define an alias for or something like, you know, the integration test, which is um, a thing that is harder to remember. So it really makes sense to to store this sort of in that alias so you don't well you see the command but you don't have to remember the exact syntax of specific things. Of course then with these things we get into the territory where you might think about actually creating a shell script instead. That depends but um, in this regard you know that's just fine for me. All right, same for Git, although I have to say all oh my Z shell comes with a lot of cool Git stuff out of the box. So you might want to see what you want to add for this. So for example, I had something like push tags, push force uh, and combination. 
and uh, that's pretty much that check out commit ba basically pretty much basic stuff i like the hub uh, command line for github uh, as well so for you know creating pull requests issues things like that I sometimes use that as well uh svn i just have for you know very old client projects but i think i haven't used it in a long long time uh docker here same story i use this all the time also these aliases are really really uh, helpful uh so you know like docker start stop docker stop all uh for example so you see for my aliases i always choose a specific pattern that i like to think of like you know a kc for kubernetes dk for docker that should not um, collide with another command obviously and then i can just combine these you know similar to your vim movements or something like that so you can just have a mnemonic um reminders or aliases that you can help you type typing this just easier all right, then Kubernetes, same story. I do have some of my own scripts, which we will also see in a second once we go over that. But basically, this is just very basic Kubernetes stuff. Again, same same fo uh, following logic, right? So KCG, Kubernetes get, get services, get pods, get deployments. And typically, if I, t uh, if I have this twice, um, get pods, and then 2p is like for all namespaces, so sort of like following this logic of, of getting um, having more overview, uh, things like that. Destination rules, virtual services for service entry. Some of them might actually be outdated with some uh, some other Kubernetes extensions that don't don't even use them anymore. It could be that I have some old Istio ones out there, but anyway. They basically don't collide with anything, so I usually just keep them very seldomly. I, I clean up my aliases if I don't need them anymore. Um, so that's that. I do have some scripts that, again, I can also invoke via alias, and that's pretty much that. Uh, Minikube, and that's it. Now, we get into global aliases, which is also a very interesting topic because they can just be expanded from anywhere which is both good and bad obviously so if you say well you have this as part of your command then this might uh, collide with something i like to um, do them in this way so why do i have a global alias for a normal command well because you can chain it as as i wrote here with sudo so then i can say okay i you know type sudo first and then it will still expand as a normal alias which otherwise wouldn't happen and especially for the ones that i have as a suffix i do a lot of aliases here with pipes so for example I have some large output here and then for example i want to grab there or i want to type less or something like that or i want to type it uh, pipe it into vim so that's really helpful i use this all the time and i have a bunch of aliases for that you know like for your typical whatever you need like head grab grab dash i uh, things like that um, copy it into your clipboard that's also really cool if you have some uh, output here uh, then you can oops then you can just say, okay, please copy that into the clipboard and it's there. Things like that. Of course, you're uh, formatting for JSON and YAML and XML and whatnot. So that's really important to be more effective on the command line. That's a really good um, alias to have and obviously a good tool to have. Um, executable. So similar thing. I think I talked about this before. I use uh, this EXA um, instead of LS. That's just like having nicer um, what do we have here uh, just nicer colors than the typical uh, ls uh, would give you so that's just you know it looks a little bit uh, cooler here but yeah and um, the same for cat i use bat in instead so that gives you some coloring if you have some i think i have some json example here um, if you have something that can just have some highlighting then this is colored uh, you know uh, other than your typical cat and things like that so that's that i again also want to have an alias that uh, is not uh, expanded uh, also there is what i forgot to mention with my curl commands there i have something that is a blank alias so it doesn't not um it does expand but it doesn't end with a space because i expand my aliases with a space so for example if i say uh e for vim and then obviously there's a space because i hit the space bar but if i say curl um localhost for example hit space but there is no space afterwards because well now i want to type the port if i say curl uh, localhost 8080 
same, you know, I need to continue with slash and what, whatnot. So I have also a function that does not uh, expand it with a space, you know, because these tiny improvements, they matter, they add up. So that's why I have this here. That's the third sort of alias I, I define in this file. All righty, then uh, same story, continuing with global uh, aliases here. I have some stuff that is, these are um, related to Kubernetes. Um, um, these are related to curl. So I basically have um, them as, as post. You know, now you might uh, comment, why don't you use HTTP and other tools? Well, just because I am familiar with the curl syntax, I know it, it might not be the most uh, the, the best one to learn by heart, but I just know it and I have these aliases. So that's why using it. Um, same with Pacman, you know, for uh, why do I have both Docker and Pacman? Well, because I give a lot of workshops on these and sometimes I use either. Uh, so that's that. I use system um, control a lot for my Linux setup. Java, obviously very important, especially something like Java dash jar JJ so that uh, this is just fast or, you know, even your Java version and this is just um, faster to execute. I hope all of you are on the latest Java version, by the way. So uh, that's that. Suffix aliases are another cool feature of Z shell. So I, by the way, if I haven't mentioned it before, well, I think I did, I'm using Z shell. So that's that. Suffix aliases are really cool there to just like start something like some program. Uh, basically, it is, uh, is very similar to what you have on macOS with open um, that this can be started in some program there. So I also have a function for that. And then you can invoke something basically uh, like you would um, invoke a, a command. So if, for example, I have what is a good example here, uh, Java dash jar might be a good example. So let's just create this. This doesn't work now because it's just it's an empty one, but I could invoke this as such. So now I can actually um, execute that and then it will uh, tell me that it is not a valid jar file, of course, because now what it would do, it does actually then uh, do a Java dash jar. So that, that's that for a zip file, for example, I have this as, uh, as well, then it will just run uh, unzip. So if I say, for example, um, zip this into a zip file, and then invoke that, then it will just display it the same way like um, unzip, sorry, I should show the alias, um, unzip list, things like that. So then you can just invoke this as such as if it's a command here, which is really, really helpful, especially if you want to use your command line as a file explorer. Um, yeah, instead of a file explorer, which is basically what I'm doing. All right, so now we already spent quite some time to go over the, the time to go over the first file. Let's continue here. What we have, I actually want to continue with the OMIZ oh shell because it just makes sense uh, from this perspective. So what I have is just custom scripts here that we can have a look at. Uh, the themes I think is quite boring, but let's have a look at that as well. So this is the first one autocomplete where I, well, you see, I uh, just have these functions for the aliases and things like that. So this just does some buffer uh, magic here um, for this. Basically, that is the real magic where uh, my actual aliases are expanded. So that's that, how this, uh, how this works. And the same for this blank alias and, and whatnot. Uh, this is the function that I use for the suffix uh, aliases to basically run the whole thing in the background. And that's that. So this is just the uh, order complete, basically the uh, alias complete uh, function there. Uh, JN for uh, Java, like I, I use JN to, uh, to manage my, my Java uh, installations here. So all of the stuff that I have, because uh, obviously I have many, many Java versions there with all my client projects and different setups. So I use this to manage it. Uh, then shortcuts, that is really cool. Um, so I use these shell shortcuts with particular um, setups. So for example, you might know about clear, which is control L. So that just usually works if you, you know, the type is in your shell and some other control something commands. But of course, you can define your own ones and you should do so. That's really convenient. So then, for example, well, what do we do very often? Very often I go here and I just say display the current uh, contents, which is basically clear and then something like LS or, you know, whatever you have, right? Like this, this particular version or this particular version. 
So basically display the current directory, which I now map to control K because it's next to L. And then it does a clear and display that. So clear and ls all in the current directory, basically, which here is a shell function that I defined. Basically this, what you see here. All right, and then I can also display this in different tree levels because I sometimes like to think of this. So that's control J or control H with a different, you know, uh, hierarchy. So here I just uh, created some test uh, subfolders, which you can see. So if I invoke tree, which just, you know, shows the current tree uh, with um, infinite uh, depth, um, I can show this with a smaller depth here, control J, um, K, uh, H and so on and so forth. So I can just go down uh, these, these hierarchies because it's very convenient to invoke this. And then with this combination, you are faster than with a file explorer because then, you know, you can just trigger this uh, with a keystroke, which is faster than, you know, even typing L and enter. It's just, you know, basically one hand movement. That's why I like it. All right, and then some other um, fancy things. So I can display the current date or a Unix timestamp. When do I use this? Uh, so for example, I use this a lot when I use uh, file uh, sort of document handling here. If I say I would like to rename my test zip to uh, contain the current date. So I do something like um, date here, test zip, which then you can expand also if just for showcasing purposes with tab, which does basically this. And then, you know, I can arrange my files as such. I do this very often for my documents. So um, inserting the current date is really helpful. Same for the current uh, timestamp, for example, for some backup files or whatever. Uh, so that's just a function for that. Oh, and also git status. So if I go to some, let's go to some, my Quarkus playground and I have some uh, change here, why ever. There is, of course, a lot of benefit in having your git commands as an alias, and you should. So that's an alias, what I just did, git status. But what I did before was just control G, which also does a clear and then a git status, right? Because I do this so often that it makes sense to define a shortcut. So that's my way of thinking. If I do a command very often, I, of course, define an alias. If I do it even so often that it's, you know, sometimes every second or third uh, command, then it might uh, make sense to think of a shortcut where I can actually uh, invoke it with control something or so just to be even faster. Um, what is that? A pen clip selection? Oh, that's just uh, pasting. So I can paste if I have uh, some command here, I go hello world with control O that copies everything here. So then I have the whole command or I say, uh, so I could have just copied it um, I pasted it. Uh, if I say I would like to have this and then paste it, the result I can do in this case, that's leader key space for me P to well paste the uh, system clipboard contents. So that's also very helpful. All right. That's pretty much that. So this is the uh, shortcut. Uh, one and then I have these uh, themes, which here is just well, that's just co some coloring. I actually don't remember why I created this, uh, probably because I wanted to slightly change uh, the theme here that I'm using. And that should be it in this folder. All right. So let's continue with the config one. Uh, config should contain uh, basically a system setup. Let's start with my window manager. That's I3 and this, well, I3 uh, status line, which is what you can see uh, there in the bottom, um, where it just shows uh, the date and things like that. That's very, very basic. Uh, so um, start with this. It just basically displays some stuff in my system with some nice emojis and that's that. What's more interesting is the config in i3. So basically, I have a very uh, straightforward setup. I'm using uh, the super uh, key or, you know, Windows key, the, the one there in the middle uh, for pretty much anything that is related to my um, system. I have uh, the setup here with a tiling window manager where I do everything just pretty much with well, either open up a new terminal or, you know, using a uh, Vim, like already starting a uh, Vim uh, in this regard that I say, open up a new uh, window here that already has Vim because I use Vim so often as, you know, a note taking a tool and things like that. So it happens very often that I just like, you know, open it up to just paste something inside. So that's really, really uh, common for me. And then I have different combinations of these. So for example, open up a, a shell, open up a shell in the current uh, working directory, which is what I just did, or open up a normal shell like in home. 
you know, without that and with various combinations. So what I did before, I split this uh, with uh, what's that H uh, Y? That's uh, what I'm uh, what I'm typing. So I'm split this into a, um, into the horizontal or well, vertical, I guess, uh, layout here and then opening either, either the shell or with Vim and so on and so forth. So various combinations here. Uh, that's that. I have uh, starting um, well a starting combination for various programs. Obviously, that's that's really important. I do use a launcher here, um, also a emoji uh, selector and a calculator uh, that is just uh, looks like uh, follows and other things. So that's that. Some audio controls. Some of uh, them are specific to I think my laptop when I define them. So you might want to change them or find out. There are some ways in Linux to find out the exact. Uh, well, I, I guess description of uh, the key that you're typing if you have a, a keyboard with, you know, these extra media uh, keys and how they are called that you can, well, control and, and trigger the right thing that you want to do. And that's that. Um, yeah, creating some screenshots and screencasts. Um, I, I have some tools for, uh, for this. And that's pretty much this. Let me see. So this this should be pretty much the default, I think, from, from i3. I'm not... Um, changing uh, much there, changing the workspaces here, moving. I'm not using switch to monitor anymore, so I, I only have one monitor. That's uh, that's another long topic on its own. So, you know, I, I pretty much don't need that. Well, technically, I have two monitors when I do the recording or screaming, streaming, but they're just uh, one to one. So it's not a different monitor that I move stuff to. Uh, scratch pad, that's really cool. Um, basically say I have a new Vim set up here, I move it to my scratch pad and then I can just highlight it, which here is a, uh, is a floating window. So I can move this around. Um, but oops, sorry, this was screwing up from my um, layout here. There we go. Um, so I can open and close the scratch pad here, which is just really, really helpful. That's that's a nice uh, feature to have. All right, keyboard layout. Yeah, I have some uh, layout switches. So to switch the keyboard layout here, and that's pretty much it. Some resize keys, and I think that should be it. All right, so that's that. That's the i3 config. I do have a config for the shell that I'm using. I have a, a blog post that was dedicated how to do uh, well, you know, if you're on Linux, then probably uh, you sometimes uh, fight a little bit with the uh, setup for your um, shell and then your colors that you want to do and things like that. So basically, I set I wanted to have a setup with a modern shell that can display emojis, but also a cool coding font. So I used JetBrains Mono, and that was then a little bit of a uh, of, a, of a hassle to set this up. So actually for that reason, I switched to this other critty or however you pronounce it, uh, the shell together with some setup. And then I also have a, sh a setup that I can quickly switch uh, for well, when I'm creating videos and things like that. So that's basically uh, the setup inside here, uh, which uses, oops, I should invoke this with a slash, otherwise it opens up a new shell here, um, that uses this particular setup to, well, I, I use symlinks to switch uh, for whichever setup I want. So basically the default here is different uh, to my video in terms of that the video one sets a big font size to what I have right now. Usually the font is much smaller than what you have on my, what you see on my screen. Uh, but that's basically it. This quote unquote terminal font is the one I defined that is a combination of JetBrains Mono and an emoji font. So you basically have to merge these fonts to then make sure you do have um, a nice uh, emoji possibility, but also then you know your your uh, your code, things like that. So that works. All right, so that's basically this uh, the setup that I have. This is actually slightly outdated. I need to updo, uh, upload uh, this. If you invoke uh, this Alacrity migrate, it will migrate this to Tomal instead of YAML. Don't ask, but yeah, that's that's what I want. So that's this. Uh, Dunst is uh, this. No, I actually don't use this anymore. I think, what is it used for? That's a good question. I think it's used for 
uh, yeah, notifications. Okay, no, I do use it. I do have some uh, notifications. They're very small on the top, which you now don't see. I almost have no notifications. The only uh, exception is when I set a timer for like, you know, three minutes or something, then there is a notification. Other than that, there are no notifications on my system. So I think that's the only reason why I needed some uh, config there. But to be honest, I don't quite remember. Uh, this is this uh, weird terminal font that is basically a combination uh, of these for then, you know, the available um, characters, which works for uh, that setup. And let's go back here. And then let's continue. So get this just from Git. Uh, this is a way to set up a global Git ignore. There's a, um, a setting in, in Git itself. So can, you can set up a Git config, you know, global Git ignore or something like that. So I have this ignored everywhere. I don't need to actually add it. So for example, sometimes I use this for my own notes or something like that, a temp uh, folder and stuff like that. So, which is quite helpful. Now, Let's go into Vim ter territory. This is the setup of my IntelliJ idea, um, idea of Vim RC. So just the setup for um, IntelliJ here. I don't want to go over the Vim stuff too much in this video because I plan a dedicated uh, video because we'll get into the, the weeds like quite quickly. Um, this particularly uh, shows some IntelliJ related stuff. So that's why I have this particular file, but also really important if you use Vim in your IDE. Really cool that you can invoke some actions, but I created some videos about that in the past. I do have my IntelliJ uh, config, which here is actually some um, collection of templates that I use, that I still use. You might want to double check if that structure is still the latest one, depending on the, on the setup. So they keep changing these locations. But basically, let's use for another one, Jakarta. I was actually just uh, recently changing this. For example, if we say I want to have a, let's have an, at inject now with the Jakarta namespace, then I can type, you know, IJT for at inject, and it does all of this stuff to have your at inject for your annotated field and things like that. So that is just really helpful to have basically the same what you would have in your editor, like uh, snippets uh, of sorts in your um, IntelliJ. And of course, I want to share them uh, with you so that you can use this as well. Alrighty, so now let's go into uh, Vim territory and my Vim RC. I don't want to go into this too much. So let me know in the comments below if you want to have more information. I plan to have a dedicated, you know, lessons learned in Vim, uh, things like that. I just very quickly want to go through this. So this is the, the settings I recommend or I use for myself. Uh, we have uh, certain uh, things here. Uh, that I use. These are my uh, plugins that I have. I actually recently updated this um, just with the setup. Um, I have a certain, yeah, this is an intendation for, for actually a context plugin um, that I use. So here, for example, now you see this, um, it, it shows the context uh, here of that, well, up, um, well next uh, uh, bigger context function that I invoke. So basically because it now is too big that it scrolls over and that's a, um, basically that's a snippet or a plugin for that. Changing some uh, re mappings here. Good question, which one is the most important, important one? Uh, I do um, have something that invokes some extra helping functions, but again, I want to um, basically have a dedicated video, video on this. So let me know if you're interested in that. Oh, this is a very cool function that encrypts uh, files that I can actually open GP, uh, G encrypted files directly with Vim, and it uh, then tries to decrypt them using the GPG tooling, uh, things like this. So that's that and some foldings yeah pretty much this so kind of interesting what is also interesting are some snippets that i use for vim so this is kind of cool uh, what it can do here you know you can just display display some emojis you can display for example the current date and things like that so if i say what is the date then you know you can have this in your editor as well or you know for unix timestamp and all of this stuff so that's kind of cool and of course you can uh, write this for your own uh, things all right that uh, should be the whole thing what I have for Vim because well my Vim setup is more like straightforward. I use the plain Vim, not Neo Vim, um, and you know this is just sufficient to show all of that stuff. 
All right, let's go into the bin, which is also um, already quite interesting on its own um, because there are a lot of shell scripts that I just accumulated over the years. These are obviously not all of them. I have some internal stuff that I need, but yeah. What do we have? So we have some i3 related uh, things. I think i3 graceful kill is just, yeah, I think it searches for specific, um, yeah, for specific programs like Vim. So for example, with, with Vim, if you open something up and then you still um, edit it, you don't want to kill your wi Windows because then you, you know, or you don't want to kill that program because then you might lose some data. So it's sort of um, taking my own logic to decide whether it actually wants to uh, kill a window with the with the program. So usually in i3, if you just like kill a window, it will do so. And that's that's it. It's gone. And here you can have a little bit more uh, logic there. So that's that. Um, let's actually go for all of them here like this. Uh, one second. Yeah. So we have this one. Then ASCII. Dog. Wait a second. I wanted this actually to be in uh, sorted in the same way. Um, this m takes a screencast and um, well outputs it into a GIF, which is really cool. So if you uh, type this, and now I have to. I do it not that often, so I actually have to have a look which uh, key combination I I use config i3 for the screencast, which is yeah, mod one and home. Okay. So if I have and I usually do a smaller window just for this. So for example, if I want to execute this, I press that combination. Now you see uh, this one. And I now can execute something, show something in this particular window, and I stop it. And then in the background, it will actually uh, invoke a program to, well, migrate this or to convert this to a GIF file, which then stores it here under, that was this one now, under my temp directory. And now I can basically display that. Why am I doing this? Well, I very often do this uh, for uh, online examples for when I show some uh, shell invocations and that is just a script that does this really nicely. So that's that. All right, this is um, a timer uh, that I can can set. I do take a combination of notify send and then, you know, uh, invoking something in the background. I'm not a bash expert. I don't know if that's the nicest uh, way to do this. So I have two, uh, this underscore timer and the actual timer and one invokes the other uh, with uh, a way where even if I uh, kill that current window, it will still be there. Um, so that's pretty much that. And then I can start a timer and, you know, uh, so on and so forth. So that's this. Then I have an ASCII-Doc view um, well, script that just takes well, basically um, an input that can come from uh, Vim. So for example, if I say I have, it doesn't even have to be an open file or something like that. I just have something here that is an ASCII doc file or an ASCII doc structure. And then I invoke this, basically what it does, it uh, compiles it uh, to, in this case, an HTML and opens it up in a new browser. And I can have a preview more or less of whatever I do, which sometimes can be helpful if I just do things. Um, and, and write things and want to see them. All right, this is that timer script what I just mentioned. Um, there we go. Capitalized title is, well, actually now I use a different one. I use a Java program. This is a bash script that just invokes uh, some title here that then I can and also invoke in my editor. So for, uh, that's the wrong one. Uh, for example, like this, then it will just capitalize. But according to the rules, not all of the words, but basically what you need uh, to have. So that's a script for that, which is just helpful. All right, create git ignore creates, well, a git ignore. So uh, that is just quite helpful in um, a git repository. So again, I have this global one, but just, you know, for your typical Java uh, project. So that's that's what I use here probably some better ways out there, but that's, you know, what I have creating a shell script with, you know, making it already executable and opening up in Vim. It's just like faster than doing all of these steps all over again. Um, Dockerize. So there are a lot of Dockerize um, 
scripts here now, which most of them I don't use anymore because some you know, of the images are outdated or um, basically the technologies are outdated. What it does, it goes into the current directory and it looks for, um, for example, this war file, and then it will already, you know, create a Docker file with what image I would like to use for that technology plus that correct uh, path. So then it will already insert this and create a file, a Docker file like that. So I can Dockerize uh, a project. So again, these scripts are a little bit older, Wildfly, Payara, uh, some of them I don't uh, really use anymore. Now, this is a cool one. This is a script that invokes my Elgato key light. So I won't uh, use it right now. Otherwise, you don't see me anymore. Um, but the cool thing is you don't have to use the app um, in Wi-Fi or, you know, on your phone or on the computer to control these key lights. They actually have an HTTP API that you can um, talk to. Um, what I did, so in order to find out the IP address, they are in your uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, you can invoke what is called MDNS, which is a pro protocol to find them out. I actually have uh, this also uh, somewhere as a functionality. So I found out uh, the IP address uh, of them. But now what I do, I just have a source uh, environment where I just set them because they're always the same there in the, in the Wi-Fi. And then it sends a call a put request uh, where uh, this is just set via JSON actually. So that's kind of cool. And I can invoke this with Elgato on or off, and then, you know, it would turn them off, <laughs> which is nice. So this is also cool. It shows a Git graph, uh, which is, so this is kind of interesting. It says Git dash graph, and there is an automatically, I don't have to set an alias. Well, I do have an alias, but uh, you wouldn't uh, need to, because I can say, uh, let me go to my Quarkus playground. If I say git graph now just with a, a space, it will look for an executable that is git dash something and then it will take graph just out of that uh, per default. And what it does, it is an ASCII art um, graph of just uh, displaying all of the stuff, which now in this particular font size looks a little bit weird. But basically you see it on the left that it would just display some things, which is really helpful. And that is the command it does. So here you see, uh, this is what I mentioned before with aliases here, it wouldn't make sense uh, to have a long, long alias. So here I actually want to have a, a, a script that I then invoke. Okay, git update, that's also a fun one that I use, especially for my uh, repositories, I can set a message here and then say, you know, uh, git update, oops, uh, git update, which then goes to the uh, top level uh, of my repository, like the, you know, uh, uh, top level directory, adds everything, commits, pulls with a rebase and pushes. So it just updates everything, all your changes, just, you know, pushes them um, basically uh, with a message, which is just very helpful for, and especially for the, uh, the repositories where I don't uh, care that much uh, about, about stuff like some internal config uh, repository, or if I know that I want to add already anything, uh, then I can use this command really helpful. All right, now some IBM Cloud uh, specific uh, scripts that I especially used when I was working for IBM. So this is using add cluster, what does it do? Oh, it um, adds a cluster with all of the configuration for Kubernetes and then sets the uh, credentials. I actually think this is a very early one. This later on wasn't required anymore. Actually, not quite sure why. Uh, what this spe uh, specifically uh, does? Unzip add cluster. Oh yeah, this this was then not required anymore. It had some um, plugin here that I needed for the authentication. Here you see the auth provider. Okay, so I could actually have a, a config and then um, describe it as such. This was really helpful. Um, then I use something like that for also I mean cloud install Istio. I have a specific Istio setup that I can do. So I, I use this very often because um, in my job, I, I was setting up Kubernetes clusters all the time for my demos. So then of course you want to script all this stuff. Same here, I want to install Nginx. Um, I want to uninstall Istio. And now we go into the Kubernetes scripts. So delete default resources, which is kind of cool. If I want to wipe everything after a demo on my Kubernetes cluster, I want to delete 
well, actually, there is no functionality to le delete everything because, you know, certain resources are just out there uh, out of the box and you need them. But for example, as to say, I want to delete all my services, actually everything except the Kubernetes service. And, you know, that's where it starts. And then you need to be a little bit more specific. So this is just this deleting anything that I don't need there. All right, delete a specific pod, which is also uh, funny because when I have an app, Hello World, for example, it always adds the, you know, extra characters, uh, usually by the replica set. And then, you know, you have these extra characters. So here I have just something that is usually taking the label app equals something that is my usually naming structure. And then it deletes uh, that particular pod if it is uh, running. So, uh, you know, you can invade it, uh, invoke it with uh, delete pod and then, you know, Hello World in case I had an Hello World app and then it deletes um, these pods yeah um, in, get the IP address of my ingress if I have one already get um, this if I have an Istio gateway with an HTTP node port you know the typical stuff that you would need for a uh, gateway for the load balancer um, get the logs of a particular particular uh, pod same story as before um, nginx IP address a pod I IP address here, yeah, internal IP, because that can be interesting. So these are internal pod IP addresses and list them in that template. Um, a port forward for my Istio um, setup for uh, Grafana, and then I guess Jaeger, Kiali, and yeah, Prometheus, which are just default uh, setups that I use. Um, a different Prometheus Federation, if you use that. Zipkin as well, depending on your setup. Uh, update deployment. Oh, that's interesting uh, for the Kubernetes uh, folks out there. If you say, I just want to make sure that a, a deployment is sort of reapplied, like redeployed, but really restarted, then you, you cannot simply do this. You could delete the pod, but that, you know, it disrupts it. So basically you can set some more or less, uh, you know, bogus uh, change. Uh, so here, for example, I say the termination grace periods, uh, seconds change from 30 to 31 or something like this that doesn't really have a big implication. But then it is a spec change. So it needs to update this deployment and then I patch it. So that's uh, uh, that reason, uh, basically. So, you know, just some uh, yeah, just some tricks here. Update deployments, plural, I think I have some, oh yeah, particular namespace or particular yeah, all deployments in that particular namespace, that same story. So I guess I use this for uh, for some reasons. Uh, these are now scripts to create a project and a project structure, which I prefer over a Maven archetype because it's just faster. I say I always want to create this in a particular way. So I make make dear and then, you know, include my palm XML. In this case, it's just an empty Java project for uh, 21 with my group ID and whatever. Um, and the Java Enterprise, in this case, JEE one that still actually uses the old group ID. We'll update this as well, which here in this case, I already, you know, do the default stuff like my JaxOS resource and Beans XML, which at that time you still need it. Uh, now, if I do this with Quarkus, for example, I don't need this. So I just uh, set up my typical uh, dependencies, what I would have and the structure. And that's pretty much that, you know, so very helpful. Uh, this is i3 related to create a new workspace where I just yeah get a new one and then you know append them uh, basically. So I invoke this in my i3 config. Um, this is a shell script for renaming some you know slides because I I do plain text slides in Vim uh, so that you know just uh, renames everything in a particular naming structure. So just um, having a numbered slides. So that's that. Oh yeah, this is a an example for my session scripts. This is actually what I use for client projects and also for presentations when I have a particular arrangement of my windows and workspaces in i3. So not always to say, okay, open up the browser, put it to workspace one, open up this, put it to workspace two, open up IntelliJ. Um, so you can just automate stuff. And especially if you have a project uh, that you work on where you always open up the same things in the same arrangement, automate it. And this is one particular example how to do this with i3. I think that's kind of cool. All right, what is this? I think a time measurement for something like this. Um, oh yeah, that executes a, a command. So same like uh, uh, the time command, but then with milliseconds, I think, for the invocation, what I had, something like that. Actually, good question. Um, yeah, so pretty much an invocation. I actually don't remember why I needed this, probably for some 
you know, some benchmarking ish type of thing. Uh, time until oh that's interesting I had this when I used I think a portable air conditioning also where you had to set uh, the time when it should start oh and it's the same when you do something like a washing machine where you can set the hours until it should be ready and then you can say uh, for example um, time until with a there is a functionality that you can where this calculates it and the date functionality you can give a string for example tomorrow 6 uh, a.m in the morning and then i can uh, say time until uh, tomorrow and when is tomorrow you define it with uh, i think um until 24 hours or uh, tomorrow in general or tomorrow like for example uh, 6 uh, a.m and then when i say okay now you know i want to start something my washing machine uh, that it's finished at 6 a.m so i have to uh, add these many hours or this minutes, just some, you know, calculation thing. So I, at that time I needed it uh, quite often. Now I would set it to like nine hours or so, and then it will turn on or off on, you know, uh, things like that. So, you know, that's where the command line really uh, shines. All right, uh, time zones, also cool to display time zones. So not to switch them, but if I say I have a meeting, which uh, for me should be at, let's say, um, 4 p.m. So then I have the like main or major time zones where I say, okay, that's the one I'm in. And, um, you know, what does it mean for the other time zones? So basically calculate this all based on mine. It needs the date because, you know, it could uh, change with uh, daylight saving times and things like that. So it just like displays it for right now. If uh, you can also set it for then a future date, which for example, end of March, we will uh, change these. It's not that smart. Um, uh, daylight saving times again. I'm not a fan. All right. This is, um, oh, that's a plugin by WAD Watt by Adam Bean uh, that I used at that time. It, it was like a hot redeploy uh, or was is a hot redeploy tool, but nowadays I pretty much use um, Maven Dev. So I had actually my own setting up for that. I'm not quite sure what I did, to be honest. Something like it was building it. I think I just rewrote it in, in bash because that was faster, something like this. And oh, watch changes for, for example, when I'm doing some technical writing and then I can invoke a command when something uh, changed, um, like, you know, an ASCII doc file, and then you can already invoke uh, the, the compilation or so. So that's that. Watch process exit. Don't even I'm quite sure. Oh yeah, it can watch a process that then invoke something else when it is exited but also nowadays i i have some led that i showed before in a previous video where i now do this slightly differently but yeah you can do some uh pid magic here and uh this is just an i3 tool that you know you can shut down your system a, a more a, a quicker if you have specific um invocations this is invoked by i3 as well and uh, this is also because of i3 which then is invoked there for just uh, i think resourcing something if you if you reopen them or something like that i also don't quite remember all right these are all the binaries that we have so it actually took uh, longer than i uh, uh, thought to go through all of them so i hope um you know if you're still watching then you know i appreciate that i do have some examples let's go over them this was actually set up when I just showed some basic uh, shell, uh, not, not basic, but like more advanced uh, shell scripting. Um, also you uh, find this uh, on my material to just an example script that shows different things like, you know, uh, these traps for cleanups, uh, PID files, how to handle this, how to do some more advanced piping, waiting for health checks, uh, number formatting, things I use uh, quite often, um, you know, as a script. So these are just a little bit of bash examples uh, that can help you there. So, oh, the GIMP, now we're almost uh, through our, that's actually just a helpful uh, GIMP script that I use because I use a GIMP with a graphics tablet to draw something and then it changes or cycles the colors that it has because I didn't find a functionality like this. Looks a little bit weird, but basically what it does, it cycles through uh, multiple uh, colors 
um, this is like you know a, a black red and then some other shades and some gray and what whatnot uh, that then cycles them in the list with I, I mapped this to C uh, the the keyboard key so I can you know use my graphics tablet and and uh, type it for a key and I don't have to use the mouse so you know good old automation and oh yeah and my ultimate hacking keyboard this is a very big uh, JSON uh, file so basically what this is is the setup that I have for this particular keyboard what I'm using uh, which shows I have to update my firmware it says uh, it shows the key map that I use on my hacking uh, keyboard and when I did a video on that I was asked to actually um, share this configuration which I didn't know you can okay it wants me to update and then I can show you well what I'm doing for my settings here so if that's interesting um, I also put that there and that is it let me go through it again I didn't forget anything okay perfect so you can find these things of course on github and I hope this was helpful to just get some a run through and some idea what I have there and why so especially the why I hope is uh, important and maybe some inspiration so obviously you will end up with uh, some different configuration and different bindings and mappings and all that but I hope it is uh, important to to get some or helpful to get some inspiration what is possible there and yeah configuration sharing and automation is always good so I hope this was helpful if you want uh, something else or you're interested in particular topics especially some more on vim please let me know also if you like the topic of developer productivity in general i have a video course available on that so link uh, down in the description below i would be happy if you check this out and as always thanks a lot for watching bye